more than 99% of everything that's ever lived on Earth is now extinct. As new species evolve, older species fade away, muscled out by their better adapted competitors. Extinction is a natural part of the evolutionary process. Every million years, 10% of species are lost. A species of bird should go extinct every 400 years. We expect to lose a mammal every 200. That's natural evolution. But sometimes there's nothing natural about it. Sometimes something bad happens, like colossally bad. So bad, in fact, that life is literally not the same after. Mass extinction events, cataclysmic moments that destroy up to 75% of all living creatures. We know of five mass extinction events called the Big Five. The most recent, the one that ended the era of the dinosaurs. That was 65 million years ago. Now, evidence is stacking up that we are headed toward the sixth. A report in 2019, backed by the United Nations, suggests a staggering one million species are at risk of extinction within the next few decades. Those past five mass extinctions were caused by unstoppable events, from tectonic shifts to natural climate swings, volcanoes, dramatic changes in our oceans, and of course, asteroids. But this time, it's different. We are the primary driver of the changes. Deforestation, hunting, pollution of ecosystems, and climate change. While that may seem depressing, it means we have the opportunity, if not the responsibility, to stop it before it's too late. And right now, it's not too late. Until their number reaches zero, any endangered species can be saved. And here is the proof. Five uniquely Australian animals and the remarkable efforts taken to pull them back from the brink of extinction. Worldwide, amphibians are in danger perhaps more than any other group. Ordinarily, we'd lose one species of frog or toad every 200 years. But right now, it's 45,000 times faster than that. 40% of all amphibians across the world are listed as threatened. Frogs, toads and salamanders are particularly susceptible to shifts in temperature, and the loss of waterways. But it may have been the popularity of a pregnancy test that led to their sharpest decline. Yes, a pregnancy test. In the 1930s, a scientist developed a rudimentary test which involved injecting a woman's urine into the African clawed frog. If the woman was pregnant, it triggered a hormone reaction in the frogs and they released a clutch of eggs. It was kind of icky, but surprisingly reliable. In fact, the tests were so accurate and the frogs so common, they were exported around the world by the thousands. For decades, they became a model organism for scientific study, kind of like the white lab rat for amphibians. The African clawed frogs have been used to win Nobel prizes, flown into space, cloned and even had their stem cells merged with robots to create living machines. But along with all that research, they also carried something far more dangerous. So dangerous it has put all amphibians around the world at risk. Batrachochytrium dendrobiditis, or BD, is a chytrid fungus. It is highly infectious and deadly, destroying skin and triggering heart attacks in frogs and salamanders. BD has driven the decline of at least 500 amphibian species, or about one in every 16. 90 have gone extinct or are presumed extinct, and another 124 have declined by more than 90%. BD could not have crossed oceans on its own. 
It arrived with invasive species like African clawed frogs, American bullfrogs and cane toads that are unaffected by the fungus. The first local transmission of chytrid fungus was discovered around southern Queensland and northern New South Wales in the 1970s, when frog numbers dropped dramatically. This continued into the beginning of the next decade, and it wasn't long before the southern day frog was declared extinct. By 1981, the southern gastric brooding frog, one of the world's most unique amphibian species, disappeared. By the mid-80s, the fungus had reached the coast of central Queensland and the northern gastric brooding frog was marked extinct. In the early 90s, just a decade after it was first discovered, the fungus had reached waterways in the far north. At the same time, it was carried south, through New South Wales to Victoria, onto Tasmania by the 2000s, and more recently, further west to parts of South Australia. It even made its way upstream to the country's highest peaks, destroying native frog populations as it spread. One of those frogs pushed to the very brink is the iconic corroboree frog. Back in the late 60s and early 70s, a researcher by the name of Ross Pengilly, he actually did a study estimating the biomass of, of crabby frogs in the subalpine and, and high montane environment. And he actually estimated that crabby frogs constituted the, the greatest vertebrate biomass in this system. So if you were to get all the crabby frogs, put them into a big ball, the ball would be bigger than if you made a ball of wombats or a ball of swamp wallabies. There were just so many crabby frogs in this system and undoubtedly they were playing a key role in the ecosystem function of the system. That once giant ball of frog is now listed as critically endangered, with as few as 50 southern corroboree frogs left in the wild. Put simply, without conservation efforts, these frogs would be extinct. Every stage of the frog's life cycle is being tightly controlled to limit the exposure to chytrid and maintain a healthy breeding population. The same reaction that caused frogs to be an effective pregnancy test is being used to collect eggs in the lab. Tadpoles are hatched and reared in carefully quarantined breeding programs, then brought here to specialty enclosures in the Southern Alps to be released. Boosting the chances that juveniles will reach mating age in the wild. And what we're aiming to do is keep these populations persistent so that way they can continue to remain here in enough numbers to keep breeding and ticking over and hopefully developing resistance to the chytrid fungus over time. But time might be running out. From July 2021, reports started coming in of dead frogs on a massive scale. It's absolutely unprecedented. We've had over 1,500 mass mortality events reported to us. So that's not just 1,500 dead frogs, it's 1,500 mass mortalities. The precise cause of this sudden outbreak is still unclear. But what is obvious is the threat to a whole class of animals that is already pushed to the brink. Amphibians are really important to us. They actually form a really high proportion of the vertebrate biomass in almost all of the ecosystems across Australia. So if we lose those, they're likely to be cascading impacts across food webs. The things that frogs eat, the things that are eaten by frogs. And we don't often think about it, but those kinds of changes can have impacts on our fruit and veg production, sheep and beef production, and the environments that we like to walk through on the weekends, where there may be untold environmental damage. Kosciuszko and the Monero Tablelands are one of 18 Australian ecosystems facing ecological collapse. So much of our continent is in trouble. In fact, 38% of the ecosystems in the world that are at risk are in Australia. The Gondwan and conifer forests of Tasmania, the Murray-Darling River Basin, the mangrove forests of the Northern Territory, the Ningaloo and Great Barrier Reefs. All but one was found to have a low likelihood of recovery and is heading towards permanent collapse. 
The collapse of an ecosystem happens when the environment changes in a substantial and negative way. That could involve habitat loss or reduced vegetation. For native species, it means finding a place to live becomes harder and harder. On the very edge of Sydney, that's exactly what's happening. For the Regent Honey Eater, the increased demand for our homes is taking over theirs. It was once seen in flocks of hundreds, migrating up and down the east coast, feasting on flowering trees like the ironbark, box and gum. Because the region honey is a nomadic, they're moving around looking for these really good trees that have had a fantastic flowering because of a big dumping of rain in a particular area. When they arrive, it's full of noisy miners and their social system can't operate the way it was. They can't get the domination they had because there are all these other larger aggressive honey eaters. And I think that's been a decisive in their demise. The pockets of woodlands have become increasingly few and far between. With suburbs and power lines interrupting their flight paths, their numbers are now down to under 350. Since European settlement, only one bird has been declared extinct on mainland Australia, the Paradise Parrot. But today, the Regent Honey Eater is just one of 20 critically endangered birds, with another 60 marked as endangered. The Regent Honey Eater is the most critical. Their numbers are so low and so they're not extinct, but you just look at the trajectory they're on, it, it's bad. So here's the saddest part of this story. There are so few Regent Honey Eaters that the species is literally losing its voice. Regent honey is calling, it's a way of um, uh, telling other birds don't come near, but it's also a way of um, the songs mean they can find each other so that um, they can form these aggregations. And it's particularly important for Regent honey eaters because they're nomadic, moving around and they can lose each other. Juveniles typically learn their mating calls by imitating adult males, but with fewer adults, the birds are learning to mimic other bird songs, like the more prevalent currawongs and cuckoo shrikes. Those calls are not what the female honey eaters are listening for. And so, finding a mate becomes impossible. We're really good at breeding regent honey eaters here at the zoo, but that's not enough. So what we're trying to find out is if it makes a difference to the birds post-release, to their survival and breeding success, if we're teaching them how to sing appropriately, that's the sound of the Regent Honey Eater, but that ain't no bird. So what we're doing here is quite unique, and we are playing wild Regent Honey Eater songs through speakers placed in a number of aviaries around the zoo, and that's so that we can teach our zoo-bred birds how to sing properly. So once they're released into the wild, they can intermingle with other wild birds and then breed and reproduce. In a novel approach, conservationists are trying to teach captive bred honey eaters the calls using speakers inside their aviaries. And what we found was that the birds from the zoo that were played song um, and learnt how to sing appropriately were outperforming the birds that didn't get song tutorage and they were surviving longer in the wild. I'm hopeful that with the right intervention, now that we, now that we actually understand what the issues are, that we can get birds to broaden their um, uh, their language by replaying the calls that have been taped from decades ago. While these better prepared birds are being released back into the environment, the trajectory looks worrying. The loss of their vocal culture may just be a precursor to their future extinction. You might think, well perhaps if one species disappears that won't have an immediate effect, but then another species disappears and another, and it's hard to judge when that will become a significant impact, but it'll definitely happen in the end. An ecosystem relies on the balance of every living thing within it, from the biggest to the small. On Norfolk Island, some of the smallest creatures are in a battle for their existence. Land snails are the group with the most extinctions worldwide, so there are more land snails extinct than any other animal group. In particular, there have been lots of extinctions of land snails from oceanic islands, um, and this is partly because of, or mainly because of, introduced predators. 
At just 34 square kilometres, there's few places on the island land snails can hide from predators like rats and chickens. After a long period without predators, when a new predator makes its way to an island, the species are really vulnerable. They've got no defences and they've got no way to escape to. They'd been pushed to the very edge of extinction. In fact, some of them were declared extinct. But in 2020, researchers discovered a small group of snails living in a remote part of the island. The last of their kind. 30 members of the threatened species Advena cambellii were collected. Collecting our first Advena cambellii for captive breeding. And caught the next flight out of there. Back at Taronga, inside this unassuming structure, the fight is on to save these species. But setting up new conservation programs for species is a difficult prospect, especially with animals barely known and documented. After our snails arrived, we had to learn pretty much everything about them. So from what they eat, uh, their behaviour, their humidity requirements, their estivation requirements. Estivation uh, is basically how, how they sleep. Uh, we didn't know their reproductive age. We don't know how many snails they are, or are born at one time. Uh, we pretty much were learning everything from scratch about this new species. Their future is very unclear, but finding them in their island home gives hope they can persist. Obviously, being a critically endangered species, there's not many of these snails left on the planet. Uh, so having you know a select few that have come here, there is a lot of pressure to you know make sure they're healthy, make sure they survive, and then ultimately breed them. Um, you know, there being so few left, it's so important that this program is successful. So the plan is ultimately to reintroduce them back into their habitat and replenish those numbers. Rediscovering species previously thought extinct is not that uncommon. They're called Lazarus species, and to date, 350 animals have been rediscovered. Like the coelacanth, thought lost in the Cretaceous period, only to be found off the coast of South Africa in 1938. The Takahi, another of New Zealand's flightless birds, thought extinct in 1898, before being found again 50 years later along the shores of Lake Tainau and the Lord House stick insect, wiped out after the introduction of rats on the island, then reclassified after a small population was located on Ball's Pyramid in 2001. Back on Norfolk Island, the efforts to save one type of snail uncovered a Lazarus. We were collecting in a part of the national park where there were lots of dead palm fronds on the ground and every one that you turn over may have 10 or 20 little tiny snails on it. And I spotted one that looked just a little bit different and I looked really close and I thought, no, it couldn't be, it couldn't be. <laughs> what she had found was Nancy Bella Quintalia, the smallest of Norfolk Island's land snails, registered extinct in the 1990s. Finding one gives hope that more are hidden somewhere here, among the leaf litter. Natural selection, as Charles Darwin put it, still plays a part in all of this. Species that can't adapt fast enough to the changing environment will die out. We generally think about our cities as places other animals can't live. But some species have learnt to adapt and even thrive. The digestion system of mice has evolved to deal with fast food. Blackbirds have raised the pitch of their calls to be heard over noise pollution. And some lizards have changed the shape of their feet to help grip onto flat surfaces like glass or concrete. Then there are some species, like turtles, that haven't changed for many thousands of years. When it comes to moving slowly, they are quite literally the mascot. The first evidence of their ancestors appeared about 220 million years ago. Since then, they've barely changed. But now turtles are in serious trouble, with about half of their 300 species threatened with extinction. Eggs, juveniles, adults and body parts are being used as food, pets and traditional medicines. 
In Australia, 11 of the 25 freshwater turtle species are listed as vulnerable. The Bellinger River snapping turtle is one of them. In 2015, a mystery disease wiped out 90% of the population. The young turtles persisted in the waterway, but interestingly, it was the breeding adults that were decimated. The survival of the species was nothing but a sheer stroke of luck. Canoeist Rowan Simon and a friend were paddling about 10 kilometres upstream from Bellingen when they spotted a snapping turtle on a riverbank. And could see that it was alive and well except for its eyes, had these big membranes grown over its eyes, so it was effectively totally blind. And that worried me somewhat, um, but I didn't really know what to do. So I just let the turtle go. And when I got back to town, I went to the vet. They didn't know anything about blind turtles. When they raised the alarm to the local council, they were ignored. So Rowan went back out in an inflatable dinghy and loaded up a gruesome haul of 40 dead and dying turtles. This time, they were not ignored. Found all these sick and dying turtles, and they were like, oh yeah, I don't know what about what to do with it. Like, how can you prove it? And I said, yep, I've got 40 of them right here in my blow up raft. So we knew from the get-go that this was a really unusual event. Having 53 sick and dead turtles in one pond, that's not a natural occurrence. So from that perspective, we were able to know from the beginning that we were dealing with something unusual and something very worthy of investigation. Viruses can come out of the blue. That's something we are all too well aware of after COVID-19 threatened to do a similar thing to us. But as humans, we've mastered the ability to fight back. That's not something any other species can do. In 1908, a species of rat on Christmas Island became the first to be totally wiped out by an imported virus. 100 years later, the Tasmanian devil population was plagued by facial tumours. The virus in the snapping turtle pushed it about as close to extinction as it's possible to get. The outbreak happened incredibly quickly. The virus spread upstream and down at the rate of approximately a kilometre per week and over six weeks it covered almost the entire habitat of the species. But fortunately, National Parks and Wildlife Service went into the last pond where the species persisted and scooped up the last 17 adults before the virus swept through. So those 17 animals now form the basis of the conservation breeding program. This is the species we're after. This is my Achilles George's eye. A captive breeding program yielded 53 hatchlings in the first two years, allowing the first 10 juveniles to be released back into the river. Now the program has returned 86 animals back into the Bellinger River. The turtle population is still facing a number of threats and they're not yet recovering in the wild. So it's going to take a lot of hard work for that to happen. Fortunately, there are a number of people and programs working incredibly hard to make that happen. Motivated by the story, the community has become part of the recovery. The Bellingen River Watch, made up of volunteers, schools and other organisations, now conduct monthly water quality tests across the river. There are rescue plans just like it all over Australia. Now the government has stepped in with a 10-year plan to save wildlife on the threatened species list. But critics say this plan requires greater funding and legal clout if it is to stop these threatened species on the path to extinction. Currently, 1,910 species in Australia are listed as threatened. And after the devastating bushfires of 2019 and 2020, another 800 plants, animals and ecological communities were identified as needing urgent assistance. The rate that mammals are going extinct in Australia is higher than anywhere else in the world. 32 are known to have disappeared since European settlement. Some of these, such as the Tasmanian tiger and Tullock wallaby, succumb to pressures like loss of habitat and hunting. But many smaller species were lost to introduced predators. 
one of the key drivers of extinctions in Australia and really acknowledged as the single greatest threat now to our endangered mammals uh, are feral cats. You know, feral cats uh, kill over a billion native animals every year across Australia. Among them, the bilby. Fossil records show the bilby has been around for 15 million years. As recorded in Aboriginal rock art and language, they were found across 70% of Australia. But now, threatened by feral cats and foxes, are limited to about 15% of the land. So bilbies are ecosystem engineers. By building their burrows, they turn over huge volumes of soil. That's really important for water penetration, aeration, it helps with seed germination, and it creates habitat for other species. A huge conservation effort stepped up in the 1990s, combined with a campaign to make the bilby the official Easter animal over its introduced competitors, which helped raise awareness and funds for conservation. The rebuilding of the bilby population is a success story in the fight to save endangered species. Breeding populations have been successfully established in predator-free enclosures, like this one at Western Plains Zoo. We started with 20 animals and we had a population target of 60. Our 2021 census shows we have about 95 individuals in the sanctuary and that sets us up really well to send animals out and found new populations in the wild. In 2019, 50 bilbies were released at Mallee Cliffs in New South Wales, the first to roam the state's national parks in nearly 90 years. 18 months later, the population was found to have doubled. The long-term goal for these marsupials is to be self-reliant in the wild. And for that, they need to survive alongside predators like feral cats and foxes. And one project is throwing them in the deep end. It's called accelerated evolution. So bilbies didn't co-evolve with cats and foxes, and so they haven't evolved the correct anti-predator behavior. So we're trying to expose bilbies to these predators in very low density so that we can get these behaviours back into the animal and accelerate evolution and, and hopefully make them heritable and change them in the longer term. It's hoped the behaviour learned by these cautious parents will be passed down to their offspring. If that happens, each generation should be better than the last. Well, there's research to suggest that you need at least 200 generations to sort of ingrain a behaviour into the genetics of an animal. But we're seeing that just within a few generations, we're seeing these changes in behaviour. So we've had bilbies that are exposed to cats are now surviving better with cats. Um, they're changing their behaviour. They're seeking out uh, denser areas of cover than they were before. The accelerated evolution approach has also been trialled with quolls and cane toads in Queensland. It's hoped it could also help Tasmanian devils, as well as corals on the Great Barrier Reef. Between travel and trade, humans have disrupted life on this planet, artificially introducing flora and fauna, bringing predators and disease, disrupting habitats and changing the course of evolution. When a species moves to the endangered list, it's more likely than not that they'll end up extinct. Stopping that trajectory is the goal. I mean, it's, it's our heritage. The whole world is looking at Australia. We have the most unusual wildlife of any continent. I mean, it'd just be enormously to our shame if we allow unique species in Australia to disappear. It's our responsibility to these animals to try to ensure that these animals that have existed here for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, don't disappear in a short period because of us. The clean water we drink, the clean air we breathe, and the food we eat needs functioning ecosystems. Now every species plays a role in the ecosystem, and if we don't protect those species, the ecosystem begins to collapse, and so will our quality of life. This investment is a way to ensure that not just the wildlife we live alongside, but we ourselves can survive extinction.